All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Jonas Oberst. Um, I, as he said, I work at HD. We are also a sponsor of this conference. And one thing we do is we have an amazing internship program. If you're at all interested in that, or if you're looking for a job, uh, please come talk to us at the booth um, next to the main entrance to the main uh, conference room. And also, as he said, is I'm going to do something that you're not supposed to do, and that is I'm going to live code uh, in front of you, because my talk title is called Artisanal Async Adventure, and it doesn't get much more artisanal than doing it by hand in front of your very eyes. So the goal is about 100 lines of Python uh, to implement an asynchronous networking framework and application um, using nothing but the standard library. And I'm not going to use async.io or Tornado or Twisted or anything like that. Instead, I'm going to actually build a tiny part of async.io and Twisted and Tornado. And to show you how this is done, we first need a problem, uh, a problem that needs solving. And the problem I have is I have come up with an amazing, amazing algorithm that will surely revolutionize the world as we know it. And I need to share this algorithm on the internet with billions and billions of people. So we need something very efficient, something very fast uh, that we can serve the world with. So I'm going to now. Oh uh, yeah, one thing is I'm going to use, um, of course, uh, Python 3.6, and I'm going to use type hints. Um, hopefully they make things clearer. If they make things harder to read, just ignore them. So yeah, here we go. My algorithm takes a number, and it returns a number. So it will take not the number, and will, it will add 42. I think everybody can understand that this is a, a much needed algorithm that the world needs. Uh, so we need to share it with the world, so we will make uh, something that can run on the internet. And I could use Flask here, or I could use Django, or anything like that, but HTTP is so, so high level. Um, that we, and we need efficiency, we need speed, so we will go lower level. We'll just use the P Python standard library socket module. So we will implement a server function that takes an address to which we want to bind the server. And because it's a server, it will run forever, and it will not return anything. And an address we define as a tuple of a string and an integer. So that's an interface to bind to. And a so our server, again, we will use the socket library. So we'll need to import socket. I'm going to use some PyCharm magic here. That's just to make importing stuff easier for me. Don't worry about that. Um, go talk to the PyCharm guys if you want to also use this amazing editor. And we will just use a normal TCP IP um, socket, so AF internet is the address family internet, that means IP, SOC stream means TCP, uh, this is just all standard stuff. And then we'll, we'll tell it to reuse the address, uh, that's just something that all the cool kids do these days, I don't actually know what this does, but it seems to be fine. <laughs> then we will bind to the address we will pass to the server and listen on it, with a backlog of 5. Again, the 5 is not really that important. It's the, the bind and the listen just tells the uh, socket library that this is a server socket and we want to accept incoming connections. So what you usually do in a, in a, if you write a server, and what we will also do here, of course, is we will make an infinite loop, so while true. And then we need to accept connections. And the way you do that is you call accept on the socket object. Accept returns a tuple of a client socket and an address of that client socket. And just to be real fancy, we will um, do a little bit of logging, or printing, whatever. And then we will take the client socket and pass it on off to a handler. That way our server function stays nice and neat and clean. And we will handle the actual protocol in the handler function. So let's implement the handler function. Uh, and the handler function takes an argument as client, which is of type socket. And I mentioned before that we want to be efficient. So we're actually going to make this client accept multiple requests in a single connection. Uh, if you're familiar with HTTP, that's similar to the keep alive or what HTTP2 does. And so we will again have a loop in here because we want the client to be able to re reuse the connection and make our stuff more, uh, more efficient. So we will read the request, which will be bytes. And the way you do that is you call receive on the socket and give it the number of bytes which is the maximum number of bytes you want to read. If we get nothing, 
uh, we will assume that the client is done with their work and they want to disconnect, so we will disconnect the client by calling close on it and breaking out of the loop. Otherwise, we will assume they will send us an ASCII encoded number, like just one, two, three. And a neat thing in Python is you can actually just take a bytes object and if it's ASCII numbers, you can just call int on it and you will get a number out of it. We're really convenient. And then the result we get by sending that number to the algorithm. And then we have the result and then we'll send it back to the client uh, using the send function. The send function takes bytes. So we'll make a, a new line delimited string, which makes it easier for the client to uh, consume and then encode it as ASCII. And now, uh, actually let's not do this. Let's just call the server, server function and we will bind to localhost 3033. And assuming I made no typos or anything at, like that, um, this should actually work. This is how you can write a socket server very simply in Python. Uh, of course, one big thing that is missing is any kind of error handling or something like that. So if you're doing this for real, maybe uh, think about that. So we'll run the server. And then in another tab uh, in our shell, we will use netcat um, and see netcat is a probably the easiest way to connect to a server and just send it some data and read out the data. And so we will connect to localhost uh, 1000 and can somebody give me a number between one and a hundred? Thank you, sir. And two plus 42 is 44. Brilliant. This works. This is amazing. Even, we can even use three. It's amazing. <laughs> now, as I said, billions and billions of people are going to use this algorithm every single day, every single second. So we will now simulate one of those other billion people in a second tab. We'll again type NECAS localhost. And can somebody else give me a number between 1 and 100? 87? Uh, OK. Uh, well, this is a bit embarrassing. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work. Um, so let's, let's try 2 again. Yikes. Um, yeah, I made a big woo. And if we look at the app, like it, it sees the connection from the first thing, but there's no really the second thing doesn't seem to happen. Uh, so s clearly we need to do something. Um, something is really not good here. And if we look at the code, um, very quickly we'll see the problem. The problem is Python by default will just run everything in a single thread and not do any kind of concurrency at all. So we have one while loop in the server that will, block for will run forever. And then we call the handler function there at the bottom. And in a handler function, we also have a while true. So this will just block forever. So our server will actually be blocked on the line 31 there where it calls the handler function. And it can never accept a second connection until that one connection is done. Now, how do we solve this? We could solve this by using threading or multiple processes. But threading is a bit tricky in Python or in general, it can be tricky to do. Uh, multiple processes, mean, processes means we need to have some sort of load balancer in front of it. And I'm, I don't want to build a load balancer right now. So we will not use either of that. We will use async and await. Now Python 3.5 added the async and await keywords. So the way we're going to do this is we just make the handler async and we'll make the server async def instead of just def. And now, of course, I, I just assume this will work. So I, again, call my app and Oh, it stopped immediately. And it complains about something has never been awaited. Uh, OK, that's, that's odd. So the thing is, if you, do, if you take a function and just add async in front of it, it doesn't actually make it async. It does something else. So let's do a little bit of functions 101. If I have a function foo, and I print foo in it, if I call foo, it prints foo. Amazing. Now, if I make an async function bar and I print bar in it and then I call it, it doesn't actually print anything. This is not print. This is how IPython shows output parameters. So we get an output thing. So let's assign this to something. And it doesn't print anything. So it doesn't seem to run the code. This is strange. And in IPython, if you do a period and then hit tab, it will show you the methods and attributes that are available on this object. And we see we have here a CR await, CR code, CR frame, CR running. And because I have read the documentation for you, I know that I'm not interested in those today. I'm also not interested in close. What I'm interested in is send. If I call send on this return object, this coroutine object bar, 
something interesting will happen. I get an exception. But importantly, I also get a print. At the very top, you see it prints bar, and then it raises a stop iteration. And again, because I've read the documentation for you, I know that is how async await works in Python. You get a coroutine object and you call send on it, and it will keep running until uh, to the next point where it will have to stop. And when it's done with everything that it, will, it wanted to do, it will raise a stop iteration exception. So that's a useful thing for us to, to use. We have a way to suspend a function and step through it one by one by one by one. What we will also need is uh, a second thing, and that is to signal from inside an async sync function out into the outside world. And this will be probably the, in my opinion, the most magical part of this whole talk. Because if we make it class foo, and we give it a function dunder, uh, double underscore await double underscore, this is not an async function, even though it says await, it's a normal function. Now, if we yield in this thing, and we give it 42 again, and then we make an async function bar, which awaits an instance of foo, and then we call bar again, and ret is again a coroutine object. Now, if we send it none, we get 42. That is because it awaits in an object that implements the await protocol with dunder await. And things you yield in dunder await will be sent out into the thing that, call, that runs the coroutine object. And if we were to send none again, it would call a stop iteration again. Now, that's a lot of theory, so let's put that into practice. If we look at our code, there's actually three points where we have blocking IO, where our code blocks for no reason other than it waits for IO to happen, for the client to send us data, for a client connection to come in, or for us to be able to send data. In the server function, it's the sock.accept. Sock.accept will block until there's a connection. So we need to change this to some sort of async accept. And I'm going to implement that function in a second, but uh, yeah, so, and that way we will try to make it so that ex if there's no connection at all, we will not block here, but let other code run. The other two points are in the handler function. If we want to receive data from the client, the client might be on a slow connection or might not be ready to send data yet. So that, again, will block forever until, the, until we have data. So we will, again, do an async receive, pass in the socket and how much data we want to read. And the third and last one is when we want to send data, it, uh, the connection, again, might be blocked. And we, again, need to have some sort of asynchronous way to do this. Now, how do we implement this? So we need an async function, async accept, which takes a socket. And returns a tuple of a socket and an address. So we need to signal that we want to read on sock. And then we can call accept on it. And we'll do the same thing for async receive. Again, we get a socket, a number of bytes, and we will return bytes. And we Again, we need to find a way to tell whatever is running all this stuff that we want to read on socket. And then eventually, when we can read on it, we will just call again receive. And we will do the very same thing for send, except that this time, we of course need to stick. And this returns an integer. We want to send to socket. So how do we do that? Yeah, before we learned that if we have an object that implements a double underscore await, we can signal things to other things. So we will inter in introduce a new class, and we'll do it a little bit like a DSL. So I call this a can function because we can do something. And we will pass it an action that we want to perform and a target. 
a target socket on which we want to perform an action. And I will just assign these two variable, uh, instance variables. And then in the under await, I will just yield those as a tuple. Now the action thing we, don't ha we haven't implemented yet, and we will just make this an enum, because again we use Python 3, and in Python 3 we have enums in the standard library, so why would we not use this? And we have two actions that we can perform, we can either read or send. And I will import enum from the standard library, and auto is also a thing from the enum, because we don't actually care about the values, we just care that we know the identity. So in async accept, we now change this with await until, await until we can read on the socket. And in receive, we do the same thing, wait until we can read on the socket, and in ascend, we say wait until we can send to the socket. This is all fine and dandy, but the problem is if we now run this code again, it, the, the exact same thing will happen again that happened before, which is it will immediately quit because the server we still don't actually run the server. So what we're gonna do is we will define a new type, a task. So we will call that um, things we wanna do, so running the server or running the handler, we will call those tasks if they're still in process and we will, call, we will define a func function add task. And what this means is we want to eventually run this code. And then we will implement a function run, which takes nothing, that returns nothing, which will then run those tasks. So instead of just calling the server, we will call the server and pass the, the returned task to add task. And then we will call run to tell it to run this task. There's one more point where we need to do that, and that is when we get a connection from the client and we have the handler, again, because handler is async, we, it returns a task, not the result. So again, we say add task handler. Now add task will be actually quite trivial to do. We will have a global list or rather a, a deck of tasks. And if you're not familiar with a deck, uh, a deck is a double-ended queue. It's basically, it's more or less the same as a list. It's just very efficient to append on either side and pop from either side which is all we want to do in this case. So we will use a deck because again, efficiency. And add task, task simply adds the task to the tasks. And in the run function, we will say while we have tasks, so while we have stuff to do, get a task and call this the current task. So this is now a coroutine object. And then we will try to get the action it wants to perform to continue and the target it wants to perform this action on by calling send on it. And as we know, this might call a, raise a stop, a, a stop iteration error if it's done with everything. So if we get a stop iteration, we will simply con uh, continue and ignore, the ignore this task. This task is done. Can I spell continue? Yeah. So this task is done. So we get an action and we get a target. And action can either be Um, read, in, in which case we will do something. It can be send, in which case we will do something. Or otherwise we will just raise a value error because something strange has happened. Uh, yeah. And now comes the tricky part. Like we now know that this task we're running, for example a server, it wants to read on the socket. So we need to do something with that intent. And the, the thing we will do is we will make two waiting areas. And the waiting areas will be dic uh, dictionaries of sockets to tasks. And we will have one waiting area for reading and one waiting area for writing, uh, sending. So if our task wants to read or wants to send, We'll say, okay, fine, you have to please move to this waiting area until we can handle uh, what you want to do. So if the action is read, we will send it to the waiting, waiting room for reading. And uh, the, socket is the, the socket is the key and the task is the value. And if it wants to send, we will send it to the waiting area for, for sending. 
So we have a way to run our tasks. We have a way to move our tasks into the correct waiting areas. Now, of course, we need a way to move them out of the waiting area back into the task queue. So we'll slightly adjust our run main loop because now the task can either be in the tasks list, it can be in the waiting area for reading, it can be in the waiting area for sending. So while any of those has anything in it, we will keep running. And because in, our, in, the, in the code that we have right now, in the current task, etc., we move stuff out of the tasks list, it might happen that we have nothing in the task list, but we have stuff in the waiting area. So while we have no tasks, we need to move stuff from the waiting area back in the tasks list. And the way we do this is um, our, if you're on Mac and or Linux and maybe on Windows, I'm not sure, your kernel will give you, your operating system will give you a API to do exactly what we want to do. And that is the select system call. Select is again a um, module in the standard library of Python. And the select call takes three arguments. The first argument is an iterable of sockets or file objects uh, on which you would like to read. So we will send the wait read keys in there. Second argument is a list of things you want to send to. And the third argument we don't care about. And the return value of this is again a tuple of length three, where the first one is a list of sockets that can be read. The second is a list of sockets that can be sent to, and the third one we again don't care about. And those are, will only include the sockets of the ones that we passed in. So we will take those that can read, can read, and we will move them out of the waiting area back into the task queue. So we'll pop it out and add it back in. And we will do the same thing for those that can send. And yep, that's about 100 lines. So again, assuming I made no mistake, and that's unlikely, if we now go back to our shell and run this, no syntax error, that's, one, <laughs> that's a good start. And we connect to it, and we again send it two, we send it three, and we go back here. In a dip, this is a sec second terminal. And we send it 87. It now works. It can accept more than one connection. Brilliant. So how, well, why does this work? Uh, let's, let's try to walk through step by step what we do. At the end, we call a task server. So server gets called with an address. So if we go to our server, because it's an async function, none of this code will run. So it gets put, it calls a tasks, which adds it to the tasks list, and then we call run. Run hits the while loop. It sees that we have tasks, so we need to run the while loop. Because we have tasks, the inner while loop doesn't run. So we go down and we pop the leftmost task out of the queue, which is our server coroutine. And we will call send on it. And send will advance this code all the way to the first await. And the await, the async accept await, sends, if we go down here, has an await can read sock, which we, means that in our run function, the action will be read and the target will be the server socket. Because the action is read, we po put it into waiting, wait read area assigned to our current task. Back to the top. We don't have any tasks right now because we've moved the server thing out, but we have something in the reading area, so we have to keep running this while loop. Again, we don't have any tasks, so the inner while loop hits. So now we will call select over and over and over again and select blocks for a while but not forever uh, uh, necessarily. So we will stay in this loop until select will in the can read return the, so the server socket because we have a connection, at which point we will move it out of the tasks. Now we're back down here again and we have the server task again. Pop it back out, call current task.send, which moves us back into the server function. So now we have the client and the address, because the await has done. It will print and it will add the handler 
to the task. We'll move back onto the while true and hit the accept again. Which means, again, the of current, current task send action is again read, target is again the server socket. We move it back into the waiting area for reading. Now, in our task list, we'll actually be the handler task, not the server task. The ter server task is in the wait read. Because we have the handler task in the, in the task list, we skip this while loop, go to the current task, and our handler calls async receive, which again signals us out that it wants to read, and the target now is a client socket. Action is read, ta target is client socket, we move it out of the task list into the waiting area for reading, and now we have both of them in the waiting area for reading, which means we hit the inner while loop again, and whichever will finish first or has data first, if there's a new connection before the client actually sends data, the server will run again. If the, if the client sends data, the handler will run. So we have it in the task again, and the client will run again until it hits async send, at which point the target will be the client socket again, and the act action will be sent, we're moving into the sending queue. So we move stuff from a task queue, a task queue the, the things that are in the task queue are coroutines that can actually run Python code, that can do something, and the things in the waiting areas are, the th are waiting for I.O. to be possible. And we move them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and that way we can handle a lot of simultaneous connections because the actual overhead of storing these things is not that huge. We just have a function object in memory, a, a coroutine object, and we have a, a, a list and we have two dictionaries. And one task will only ever be in one of those three. So we just move them back and forth and back and forth and we can handle a lot of connections. And yeah, this is more or less it. And what I hope, what I hope happened here is that I showed you that async network is complicated. Yeah, we did a few fancy things. We called some uh, select function might be a bit scary. Uh, if, uh, and, but it's not all that much code. It doesn't take all that long if you sit down and read the documentation and maybe look at other implementations. So I'm terribly sorry, but this talk actually has homework. Because what I hope you all do <laughs> is when you go back home, maybe tonight, or if, you, if you're not from Singapore on your flight back, that you sit down and actually try to do this. Like, write this down yourself. Um, or maybe wait, I think the video will be made available later, so maybe do it while watching the video. That's fine, that's fine, you can, you can cheat. But try to understand, while you're writing it, try to understand why this works and how this works. And then maybe as a little bit of an extra extra task, change the run function to not use select. Um, try to use kq. That's a thing that is also in the select module. It works slightly different, does the same task, but it works slightly different. If you're on Linux, uh, try to select.epoll and see how that works. If you're on Windows, try select.defpoll and see why these work different and why maybe epoll, kq, and their friends are more efficient than the select call. And yeah, with this, I think my time is also up. Um, so if you have any questions, I would love to try to answer them. I'm also around for the, the rest of the conference. So if you have long form questions or comments, feel free to talk to me. I'm usually at the booth uh, of HD. And yeah, thank you very much. I think this works better for um, IO-bound tasks. Yeah, this, on, this only works for IO-bound tasks. And how can you customize the work for processor-bound tasks? Yes and no. Um, no as in async IO only works for IO. Yes as in you can make this work with threads or processes. So you can make it under, so you can await threads. So you move your, uh, your CPU-bound tasks into a thread or you can make it work with subprocessors, so you can await subprocessors, and you move it, and you move your CPU heavy task into a different process. But in general, yeah, you, this is not a solution for CPU heavy code. This is a solution for IO, IO heavy code. For your CPU heavy code, you still want to use the same tricks and techniques that you use right now when writing Python. Yes.
So I, I guess the stock iteration exception is a sign that on some deep level the flow control is accepted. Yeah, that's so, it. Oh. So how um, I, 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 mm -hmm. that's okay. so how fast or scalable is this? At what point do you have to write the loops yourself and not use exceptions for flow control? And this is a the the, the exception is a C Python uh, implementation specification. That's how async function, how coroutines work, how C Python defines coroutine functions to work. So you don't actually get to choose how what to use for flow control. I meant when you have to just not use when you've gone beyond the scale. This will answer, but a handle. But I guess the answer is if you're using Python, it's a C exception. And it's fine. Basically, yes. Any more questions? Yeah. 大丈夫です。えっと、この Python におけるこれ動きは、えっと、JavaScript と同じコンカレンシーになるシングルスレッドバンクスレッドではなくてシングルスレッドです。いや、そう、いや、This still runs in a single single process. It doesn't use threads, doesn't use anything fancy. This is one thread in one process. And yeah, this is if if you're curious, this is you might think this is a toy thing that I wrote right now for this, but this is literally how async IO works at the core. They have fancy stuff like error handling, <laughs> and Tornado also uses the exact same thing. Twisted uses the same thing. Node.js uses the same. Node.js works like this. Um, they're working in Rust right now to add this to Rust. So, yeah, this is actually how how these kind of things work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, I didn't fully understand what he was asking, so <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah, I'm going to question. Of course. So uh, how does this relate to promises in JavaScript? Right. So how in before Py we had async networking, event-driven networking in Python before Python 3. In Python 3, we got async await. So what we in the Python 2 world, what you used to do is either callbacks or something like promises in JavaScript. Uh, the twisted framework has a thing called deferred objects, which are very similar to they solve the same problem as promises. Async IO in the standard library has a thing called a future, which again is effectively the same as a promise. So you can use promises, promise style um, with async, uh, async uh, event driven networking. It's just that generally using async await is a lot more convenient and nicer to write. <laughs> okay, any more questions? If not, then thanks, Mr. Jonas. Thank you very much.